Welcome to Peak Radar Live. I'm Angela Seals with the Cultural Office of the Pikes Peak Region, and tonight I welcome you to this special episode of Peak Radar Live as we introduce the local community here in the Pikes Peak Region to two new arts leaders at the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center at Colorado College. Joining me tonight are Michael Cristiano, uh, who is the Director of Visual Arts and Museum at the Fine Arts Center, and also Perone Yousafzadeh, who is the new uh, Producing Artistic Director at the Fine Arts Center Theater. Hello, welcome both of you to the show. Hi, Thanks Angela. for having us. It's great yeah. to be here. And so we're going to uh, have a really lively program tonight where we will have some guests joining us live to ask questions of Perone and Michael. We have a video question. We have questions people have submitted in advance uh, and some other surprises along the way. So we hope you'll uh, stay with us and enjoy getting to know uh, these two folks who are going to be part of the legacy and the story of the arts in the Pikes Peak region. And it's all just beginning right now. Uh, so you've just come to the community. And my first question is about about uh, what drew you here? What was it that made you choose to join this arts community? And I'm gonna start with Perone. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, there were multiple reasons. Uh, first, uh, I will say Idris Goodwin, uh, the executive director of the Fine Arts Center is a friend and a collaborator of mine. And so I was um, Immediately, my interest was piqued uh, when I heard about the position and the opportunity to get to work alongside him. And um, the another component uh, among many that was very uh, compelling to me was the fact that um, the Fine Arts Center is uh, located at Colorado College. Uh, I think that the future of the arts is one that is very much and inextricably linked to younger generations. Um, and I think it's essential that students are able to experience uh, the arts from a very young age um, and to uh, not necessarily because that's going to be what they pursue for their careers, although that's great too, but, um, but to uh, hopefully make it um, a normalized part of our culture to go to the theater, to go to a museum, uh, to experience art and culture and dialogue with and grapple with difficult and challenging material um, as we're coming of age, figuring out our worldview and you know, um, emerging into adulthood. So um, that opportunity here felt really uh, special. You know, it is a special thing about the Fine Arts Center when it opened to have an art school and a theater and a museum under the same roof. Uh, that interdisciplinarity was so unique at the time. And now to have the college integrated, um, you're not alone in feeling like that's a really special thing. Michael, what was it that made you decide to take the leap and, and move to the Pikes Peak region? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to sort of double down on on the Idris uh, factor and, and, <laughs> and also like it, it's... Um, you know, for me coming out of an institution that was also affiliated with, with a, a university, there was something very special about that relationship. And there was a, um, like the framework and values expressed during the affiliation between the college and the Fine Arts Center just really resonated with my personal values, my professional values, notions of like nurturing a community of artists, uh, thinking about and building a program or relationship to place, creativity, collaboration. It felt like the, the tenants that were guiding the affiliation were just really um, rich uh, for for me and uh, being part of the, this particular chapter of the Fine Arts Center's life as it thinks about how it builds a program and relationship to the college this is super juicy and super exciting and and concurrent to that you know moving to a place like Colorado Springs that is just growing and growing and growing and that seems like it's going through its own kind of um, uh, next chapter or next phase to think about the sort of layered context of a fine arts center in a college, in a community like Colorado Springs and, and how that all fits and nests together is a really juicy, interesting um, context to, to work in. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm excited about all of those things. And then the, the team at the fine arts center is just wonderful and has been doing just incredible work. So there's a lot of history to build on as we think about charting a program for the future. Well, we all share your level of inspiration of what's coming out of the Fine Arts Center now and what will be as that ecosystem of creativity keeps growing 
in the years ahead. Michael, you mentioned your values uh, from your you know past career that you're bringing to you. And so uh, I know someone who has a question about that and I'm gonna uh, bring her on screen now. This is Jasmine uh, Delavu, who is a local artist and activist in town known by probably a lot of folks who are watching the program now. Hi Jasmine, thanks for joining us tonight. Hi, thank you for letting me hop on here and ask my question. And um, first off, I'm just really excited to have both you guys um, joining our arts community, uh, I think what you guys are bringing to the table is incredible, um, and I really admire it. Um, my question for both of you, I guess, is sort of a double-sided thing. Um, one being, what responsibilities will you hold yourself to in this new important role? And what will the arts community be applauding for you in the coming future? Who wants to take a first answer to that? The question about legacy, right? and what you're gonna bring into your legacy here. Yeah, I will, um, I'll give it a, I'll give it a whirl. And thank you for that question, Jasmine. I, you know, for me, uh, leadership is, is, well, obviously about so many things, but first and foremost, it's about accountability. It's about making sure that I'm not just talking the talk, I'm walking the walk. And, um, you know, something that really has stuck with me, uh, ha has always been my, you know, one of my first memories of actually going to the theater as a child. And um, my, I grew up in Chicago and my parents took us uh, to see um, Broadway musicals when they toured and, and came to Chicago. And I um, remember seeing a production of Les Mis and um, being so moved by it and feeling like I understood what it was to suffer, <laughs> to live a life of regret. Um, and also alongside that was this sort of tacit acceptance that no one on stage looked like me nor ever would. And so, um, so my responsibility and my legacy, I hope, will be that I helped foster an environment where everyone felt seen, um, where everyone felt like they saw their stories told and where everyone could imagine if they wanted to that if they if they wanted to enter the the theater and performing arts um, profession that there was a place for them and um, that wasn't something I felt I had um, I felt like I actually was just trying to blend in and hope nobody noticed um, for a long time um, although with a name like mine it's like pretty hard to blend in um, but you know but. What I, what I want for the next generation is that they can um, stand in the full glory of their humanity, of their identity, um, of every aspect of that, and, um, and never um, question the way I did um, that they're too brown or too female or too anything um, to be able to be part of what is so essentially human, which is for us to tell stories together. Um, so, um, I feel res responsible for that. And I, and I hope that, you know, if that, if that's something that, that a young person can feel after coming to the fine arts center, then like that, that to me is a job well done far more than any accolade or any great review. Oh, wow. You know, I had to stop myself from putting up my size and pictures. I was like, oh, this would be good illustrations, but I just couldn't stop listening you know I, th I think when you're speaking from a place that's so real to you like that moment I just wanted to see your face and, and your eyes and thank you for for sharing that you could tell what a passion that is for you um, Perone. Uh, Michael uh, yeah I mean I, I, feel like I feel like I'm going to be in a space of just like re like like lifting up what Perone's saying because it's it's so spot on and I just feel incredibly fortunate not just to be in this dialogue but to be working alongside um Perona at the Fine Arts Center, um, but but to build just a, a little bit, um, I do want to like just really second that that notion, and and I think part of what part of the responsibility, my responsibility, and the responsibility of an academically affiliated art institution or museum, um, you know that that is responsible for for shaping histories, is to continually push beyond the received narratives, the received canons, to to make new meaning and to build new knowledge and and I think like I, I find um, institutions like ours uniquely situated to do that and to be spaces of convergence uh, for people who have different forms of expertise, different perspectives and different lived experience to, to collectively make that meaning together. Um, so it just, it feels important for me and, and part of what I, I hope I can 
nurture um, at the museum is, is a culture of collective practice um, where we are coming together to exchange ideas, practices, imaginings, um, and, and I guess um, concurrent or, or in, um, in line with, with that to, to do all that we do in partnership with, with members of our community, both at the college and, and beyond. Uh, I don't believe that the museum should be doing its work in isolation if, if we're truly in the pursuit of, of making new meaning and, and shaping new knowledge, you know, we have to bring lots of voices into that discussion in order to, to, to shape that. And in my experience, it's those enduring partnerships, those partnerships that, that last year over year that are most reciprocal, that are most um, uh, beneficial, where you learn the most, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in transactional experiences, right? Like I, I want experience to unfold over over time and to be alongside others as we as we um, experience and, and process those things. Well, tonight is a great beginning to that, uh, to continuing to form a community of practice is getting to know each other uh, as artists and arts managers in the same community. I hope you'll have a chance to talk more with Jasmine in the t times ahead. Um, one of the joys I had in preparing questions tonight was I was excited to introduce you to a few folks and, and she was one of them. So thanks for joining us tonight, Jasmine. Thank you. Do you have a response? Yeah. I guess I did. Do you have a response to their answers? Um, I'm just, it feels like such a breath of fresh air to hear those two perspectives. And I'm so eager to see these um, words turn to motion. And I'm, I'm incredibly eager. Um, I think it's really admirable. I'm pretty excited for both you guys. Great. Well, thanks Thank again for, for joining the show tonight. Yeah. Perone, in your um, answer to the my first question about why you came, you mentioned the joy of being embedded within a university or within a college mm -hmm. as well. And and I have a question from Jody Paproth, um, who is one of the founders of Springs Ensemble Theater and also an educator with the Cheyenne Mountain High School. She's the theater director there. Mm -hmm. uh, and her question for you is, how do you plan to coordinate with the CC Theater Department you have some amazing in-house professionals and educators. And she names Chris Shelley, Holly Rawls, S.B. Parks, Idris Goodwin, and of course yourself. What um, that she, she knows that CC students would love to, to learn from. So how do you see the theater company integrating with the theater students? In, in, in many ways, I mean, we're just getting started um, in these conversations. I, I, I officially moved to Colorado Springs at the beginning of December, and I'm actually now in um, a hotel in North Carolina. <laughs> but, um, but already, you know, Idris and I, um, along with Chris and Holly and Nathan, we've started conversations with um, uh, several faculty members in the theater department around um, continuing a partnership that's actually beginning this year where um, uh, uh, Lisa Marie Rollins is actually directing um, a, a co-production between the theater department and the Fine Arts Center of The Wolves by Sarah DeLapp, which we're all very excited about. And mm -hmm. um, I think that there are countless ways for us to um, engage in terms of connecting with academic departments around their syllabi to see how our programming might intersect with what they're teaching in the classroom, um, to creating hands-on practical learning professional opportunities for students interested in all aspects of theater, not just acting, but also um, technical theater production, yeah. arts leadership, dramaturgy, um, design, and um, and also to continue to find ways to collaborate with these incredible professors like Lisa Marie and Monica Sanchez, who are um, uh, expert professionals and crafted artists in their own right. So um, uh, in, a, in a number of ways, my hope is that all of these efforts can ultimately make the FAC a a Friday night destination for a student at CC. Um, uh, as an audience member, as well as a place where folks feel like they can um, uh, attain the opportunities that they need to in order to um, build the craft, the skill, and the confidence um, to pursue any aspect of the arts professionally. You know, we just finished our regional cultural plan, Arts Vision 2030, and one of the things it talks about um, is uh, kind of this scaffolding of, of young creatives and getting them 
alongside older creatives so that they are supported in the growth of their practice and understanding the career paths that are available and, and what's oppor what opportunities are here in this community. And I, I see you both as sitting in a really special place in terms of kind of following that intergenerational you know, spectrum uh, and making sure that, that folks further in their career and students at CC get a chance to, to create alongside each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I asked you both to share with us uh, two uh, portraits that, um, one of each of them, I asked them to share a portrait that would tell some important story about who they are. And I really love that you both shared group pictures. <laughs> and I, think, I think that that says something. One, it might say something about the kinds of pictures that you take of yourself, but also I think it says something about the way you both approach your career and your creativity as a collective act. Um, so I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that was something I, I noticed right away. It uh, looks like we have Perone's up here first. So Perone, tell us why you chose this as a, a meaningful portrait of your career. Um, I just have to admit that Michael sent his first. And so I thought, oh, I can do a group photo. Great. <laughs> Um, because so, I really overanalyzed the assignment, but, um, but I, you know, um, I, I chose this photo. This is a, a group photo of, um, a cast and, uh, uh, myself and a stage manager for a reading we did of Hannah Khalil's play, uh, scenes from 78 years, mm -hmm. um, which is, uh, a play about the Israeli occupation of Palestine. Mm -hmm. And, um, I suppose that, you know, uh, upon, I, I love this photo because so many of my chosen collaborators and favorite and most cherished, um, relationships are represented mm -hmm. in this photo amongst this cast. Um, and also, um, you know, thinking back to little Perone watching Les Mis, who was like, well, I love this, but like, there's no one like me here. Um, mm -hmm. It is, um, uh, to me, very essential, not only for myself, but for all of the artists that I invite to um, the Fine Arts Center to create spaces where um, no one has that experience of being the only one, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, and what I love here too is that there is there is um, a, a great diversity of Middle Eastern and North African identities and experiences in this room. Um, some folks are immigrants, some are children of immigrants. Um, and, uh, and that that multiplicity and kind of nuance is only possible when we are radically inclusive and hospitable, mm. where one person doesn't have to represent like billions of people from an entire region <laughs> of the world. <laughs> um, right. But that we can see um, oh, that yeah. within um, within any demographic, uh, what we experience is nothing, n n not a monolith. Beautiful. And Michael, how about your group portrait portrait? Yeah, I, um, <laughs> so this is a picture from uh, a project that was really uh, special to me. We had um, at my former institution, the Smart Museum at the University of Chicago, um, I had hosted a group of, uh, a group of folks um, uh, to be in residence at the, the museum. The, the organization that we were partnering with were called Redline Service. And they developed uh, cultural programming with um, folks who are experiencing housing transition. And mm. we had engaged uh, Redline to be in residence to think with us about what it means to belong in cultural spaces. Mm. Um, and, and often, um, like, Redline came to be in part uh, because, you know, like, th this is a group of folks who are, who are often incredibly marginalized, not just in cultural spaces, but in public spaces. Um, and they... they Part of their goal is to not just bring um, the issue um, in, into visibility, but to foreground the expertise and lived experience of, of those folks who are who are often so very othered, right? Um, so so it just made sense for us, like that we as an institution were thinking about what it meant to, to belong in in a museum, and and this organization was thinking in in very specific and, and to your point, per like very radical ways about what inclusion should look like. 
Um, so we did a we did a whole number of, of things over the course of, of the year. Uh, the, the 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 programmatic partnership um, concluded with a, a day long art festival, and and the goal was to, you know, it it was to like it it was just to be our festival. Like it wasn't about like who was housed, who was, who was housing insecure. It was, we were all together experiencing um, and the arts. And then we um, orchestrated a little sleepover at the museum. So, so we could have smaller, more intimate conversations wow. about, about the issues. And, and then also um, just to be right. And to be to, together. Um, so there's a group of, of, you know, folks uh, from our partner, there are some staff, um, who slept in the museum. So, and, and it felt, and then we woke up the next morning and we, we ordered in some pancakes and, um, and, and hung out and, and had some other partners come in and, and talk with us. And it just like, for speaking from my own experience, it, it transformed the museum space fully and in, into mm. a side of community, um, that I felt part of, like, it, it wasn't that I was trying to structure community for others. It was, I was, I was part of that community that had that, that experience. Um, and, and it's sort of like, like those people I was standing with, like really shaped my sense of, of what these spaces can be if, if we are intentional about how we, um, how we structure them, how we invite people into them um, and, and how we leverage them for powers for this kind of uh, collective questioning and, and coming together. Thank you. You know, w the way we use museum space um, is also something that's a little challenging for you to be demonstrating your goals with right now in the context of the pandemic. So one of the questions that we had in advance is from Sean O'Malley, who is a very well-known uh, visual artist uh, in town and whose work is in the permanent collection yep. of the Fine Arts Center. Um, and Sean said, I am a member of the museum. Recently, I was in the museum and I found almost no art on view. Many walls that were once filled with art, old and new, were bare. Galleries were on extended closure. Is this reflective of a new aesthetic governing the activities of the museum? And I, I hear in Sean's question, trying to see what are your choices and what are things that are, you know, perhaps just right now for some transition reason or, or pandemic reason. Can you help him and us understand that? We're going minimal, Angela. That's like <laughs> taking the stuff down, clean walls. No, just we, um, um, yeah, I don't know exactly when, when Sean was there, so I can't say specifically. Um, but, but I will say part of what we are talking about right now is, is exactly this is like, you know, we're trying to understand like what is the pace and rhythm of our exhibition schedule. Um, and, and I will say that it, it feels important for us to think about extended durations of, of exhibitions for, for a few reasons. One, uh, to my mind, if we are orchestrating exhibitions that are up for a longer duration, it creates much more opportunity for engagement um, through and with those exhibitions, opportunities to do more programming, to, to, to experience the shows longer. Um, and you know, from, from my point of view, the, the, there's a kind of pace of production in, that's often in the art world. We're constantly training, mm -hmm. turning shows over. Mm -hmm. um, and it often feels to me like you, you really can't like, it's, it's like you blink and a show is up and it comes down. Right. And, and it's like, wh why are we on that kind of that pace? Why can't we slow this down so we can spend more time with this work so we can let the work kind of evolve and, and, um, kind of speak to us over, um, over a longer period. And, um, I think it's also important for, for us as, as cultural workers to, to build that relationship with the art like i'm i'm not so interested in just putting up stuff like i really want to wrestle and grapple with whatever it is that we're doing to let the lessons of that art inform our practice right and, and we can't do that if we're just like just hustling 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 and i think there, it's also really important to recognize the the volume of labor that goes into producing something of the scale of an exhibition right like um and so like you know, I, I, in my in my dream world, and this is something we're also starting to talk about, like that labor is not invisible, right? Like it'd be so much cooler if there's spaces, um, and I, you know, all credit to the team here because they've been thinking about this stuff, where the work of like producing an exhibition or caring for collections is is as on view as as the exhibitions we're mounting because it's it's mm. equally important, and significant, right? Like so th there's a degree of like. Um, of making all that transparent and, and a more public facing part of the work of a museum, um, in addition to the incredible stuff 
that that is inhabiting that that space. So we're 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 in the process of of um, you know, thinking about that that rhythm and and contending with all these issues that I think have historically driven uh, the pace of and rhythm of production. Great, thank you for that answer. You know, and, and I think it e very easily leads into just one other uh, question from Gundaga Aspon Stevens, who is a, a well-known gallerist in town. She owns G44 Gallery. And, and Gundaga has a question I think everyone has for you, Michael, which is, what are you thinking of doing from exhibits? Um, curious what direction you're going to be taking them, she says. Will it be more focused on local and regional artists or a national and international artists? The focal point of future exhibitions be like contemporary art? Or are you going to stick with the Southwest Spanish colonial, curating your own or sourcing out exhibitions? So uh, we understand you saying like you may slow down the pace of the change so that you can go deeper. But within that pace, what are you thinking of putting on the wall? Yeah, um, great question. And, and again, I... I, 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 we're, we're just teasing these things out, right? Like, um, and, you know, so, so I'll say, I'll share a couple of things. One, I think it is really important to, for us to explore the, the, the story of our place um, and, and, and for us to ask big questions that, that drive that investigation. You know, so for instance, I, you know, the, the, the Fine Arts Center has long shown Art of what we now call the the Americas, and and I I think we're we're excited to think about what exactly does that mean when we say art of the Americas. What are we what are we talking about? How do we think about issues of identity when when identity is associated with geography and the the kind of the layers and and nuances of of that? So so for my practice, it feels excited. It feels more exciting to start with the question. And, and then, you know, the work is a, revolt, a result of that line of inquiry. You know, all that said, we also have an incredible collection of work that is primarily composed of uh, Spanish colonial material, work by Native American um, artists and, and makers, uh, work produced by Southwest Regional Art. And, and we, sh we absolutely will, will build on that history, right? It's, 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 it's core to who we are. Um, and, and part of what it means, I think, to build on that history is, is to really unpack those, those stories and put them into relationship with one another. It's, it's, it feels like we can arrive at a much more interesting uh, and comprehensive story of, of our place if we are putting the work we have by Native American artists in relationship to the work of, of um, Spanish colonial artists. And, and we can see through lines and thread lines. We can also understand some of the colonial practices embedded in that work and tease those out, right? Like, so, mm -hmm. so I think it's important to, to really think about storytelling in that kind of nuanced way. Um, and, and I would say, if you look at the, the museum's schedule right now, it is, it's, um, or the schedule that we have for this spring, it is absolutely a mix of, of uh, regional artists. We'll be showing, we have a project with Floyd Tunson. We have a project right now, Kukuli Velarde, this incredible it, uh, artist who lives in Philly, originally from Peru. Uh, we have an, a show coming up with um, Juan Robert Diago uh, from Cuba We're doing something in the summer with Desert Art Lab from Pueblo, right? So, so it, it absolutely, to my mind, is a mix of the um, regional, national, international to get to these types of stories. Thank you so much. I'm mm -hmm. excited to see what, what happens next. Now we're going to bring a live guest uh, back on uh, to the broadcast with us. Joining us now is Lynn Hastings, who's a well-known actress, director, and leader in the local theater community. Hi, Lynn. Welcome to the episode. Hi. How are you? Oh, great. Thanks for joining us. Uh, go sure. ahead and ask your question of Perone about the Fine Arts Center Theater. Sure. Um, there's a lot that's happened. You know, we've had COVID, George Floyd, Me Too, um, We See You, White American Theater. And so there's a lot that's happened and art should reflect what's going on in our lives. So I think now's a great time um, for theater organizations to take something that might have been an initiative in the past and turn it into, you know, part of your cultural um, tradition and part of the organization. And I think that audiences and arts community members expect that from theater. So mm -hmm. I was just wondering, you know, what your plans are um, in 
changing how the fine arts center looks so that people who are underrepresented underrepresented in this community see themselves not only on stage, but also in the audiences. Thank you for that big necessary <laughs> behemoth of a question. Um, uh, there, first, I, I just want to say that um, this work is iterative uh, in terms of um, disrupting the traditional white supremacy of the American theater. Um, this work uh, also has been happening, and I want to acknowledge that in theaters run by um, uh, theaters that are that are run by global majority teams um, uh, outside of sort of the traditional um, larger American regional theater model. And um, and a lot of folks have were doing this work before we see you, before George Floyd, um, and um, and to everyone who began in light of those events, um, welcome to the party. We're glad you came. Uh, so, um, you know, for me, um, it's it's an iterative and holistic approach that. Um, that, that relies on a culture of abundance and possibility as opposed to a culture of scarcity. Mm. Um, uh, the, the typical American theater audience is actually an extremely niche audience. Um, when we think about it being, generally speaking, across the country, um, older, uh, upper middle class to um, and up, <laughs> um, predominantly white uh, and often suburban, that is, um, that, is a, that is a narrow subset of a subset. And um, with us being located on a college campus and having immediate access to engage a younger audience and in a, um, in a city with um, communities of color who have not systemically felt welcomed, I think that it is important that they see themselves reflected in the stories that we tell, um, the staff they meet when they come in to the Fine Arts Center, um, the, uh, the radical hospitality I hope they experience. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, I think it re requires that we rethink our model, not just in terms of um, what that programming is, but how are we getting the word out? What are our channels? Um, and how are we making this space one that is accessible and welcoming? Um, financial accessibility, I think, is a big part of that. That's real. Um, but I don't think that's the only part, because I think yeah. that there are plenty of global, global majority people who have money, um, but, but need a reason to spend it. And that... Um, this won't come overnight. Um, and I think a lot of theaters don't try because they're afraid of goofing it up. And I think we have to be okay with making mistakes and with a little trial and error and certain things working and certain things not working, as well as it taking time. And this is where I'm going to steal from Michael. We have to take our time because if, if you've been told your whole life that, you're, that a certain place wasn't for you, it's not going to change just because one year the season is a little more inclusive or one year the hmm. marketing is a little more hip or like whatever it is, you know, yeah. um, it's, it, it, it is going to require that we build trust, that we actually build meaningful relationships and that we're building programming with the communities we want to engage instead of just saying, hey, we chose this August Wilson play, wanna come? Um, because it, that also bears a kind of assumption that certain global majority communities are only interested in certain material. And without actually having that conversation, we don't know that. Um, so, um, so to me, it's, this is the work. Like this is this is the job as far as I'm concerned of running a theater company. Um, it's not part of the job. Uh, it is the job to say 
how are we going to start having conversations around building meaningful, transformative relationships that ultimately allow us to see that transformation at the theater company at the Fine Arts Center? Awesome. Awesome. Lynn, do you have a response? You, I mean, you've been part of this work in this community for many years. What are your thoughts? Um, I really think that our community has made leaps and bounds, especially in regards to the stories that are told um, and making sure that um, folks have a seat at the table. Uh, I think, you know, it will take time and I'm patient, but I do think it needs to be part of an organizational culture to make that table extend out into your community and getting out and building those trusting relationships. Not like you said, relationships that just happen uh, during Black History Month or when there's one particular piece that is out there that um, speaks to an underrepresented community because they'll come at one time, but they don't become part of the family. They don't sit at the table. You know, they come, they grab their food and they go, you know, for, you know, lack of a better uh, analogy. So um, it's just nice to know that our community can start doing this and start doing it wholeheartedly, holistically, um, and with some new energy, which is always good. Thanks so much. And thanks for joining us, Lynn, and, and always being um, part of this ongoing conversation. I appreciate you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, you know, th that I think leads into, you know, real, uh, a question that I had actually, which was about what's happening at the Fine Arts Center already that you're inspired about continuing. And, and building on. A lot of the questions from folks have to do with the new things that you'll do. Um, and as Lynn was talking and as um, Perone was talking, I, I found myself just inspired to put up this picture, right? This is City as a Venue last summer. I wonder, I wonder how you're feeling about City as a Venue in the year ahead, in the years ahead, or, or other programs that you think um, do embody the values that you've articulated tonight. Yeah, I think City is Venue is a huge one. Um, it's actually, I, I actually um, had the great fortune of seeing a performance of Where Did We Sit on the Bus uh, back in August when I was here for a week of onboarding. Um, and I think that, um, uh, uh, it, and the show, of course, was um, fantastic. Uh, uh, and from what I also learned about the other offerings during City is Venue, um, that is, um, to me, the, the work of, of true community engagement, of finding um, ways to engage local artists, to tell local stories, um, uh, to uh, share and celebrate the rich history of Colorado, of the Springs, um, and, to, and to really, um, you know, allow the, um, the Fine Arts Center to be more than a building, but, um, but um, a sort of a, a, a part of the cultural fabric um, in a way that um, moves past even um, those walls. Um, so uh, there are discussions underway to, um, about what this summer's city is venue will look like. Um, I think Front Range Fables is certainly um, a, a beloved piece of that. Um, and something that I'm also really excited about in, um, which, you know, obviously doesn't, um, uh, is, is the less glamorous side of it is just like the conversations happening internally right now, um, where we are interrogating some of the assumptions and the status quo around, um, how things have run in the past, both at the FAC and in general, and also, you know, to what Michael was talking about, where we're having really meaningful conversations around capacity and around taking our time, um, which in um, a scarcity and haste-based culture is a pretty radical political act. Um, and so um, I, I think that, you know, changing, shifting culture happens in small rooms and um, uh, that ripple, you know? And so I'm very, um, excited by what is emerging from some of the brainstorms with um, my colleagues and my um, my wonderful staff, um, uh, because I think it's it 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 isn't just around I think um, uh, what we produce; it's also how we produce that mm -hmm. I think will um, really uh, demonstrate the 
the shift in culture and the progress that we envision for the years to come. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Is there something you're in that people already know that you're inspired to continue? I, you know, I think this is like the exciting thing about being at an institution that does have such an incredible and long history, right? Like that there's, there's, there's such rich examples throughout that history to, to draw on. I think for, for me, there's a, there's a number of things, right? Like I, I, I have, I, I am glad to be part of a team at the museum who are just, and have been doing incredible things. You know, I think like the, the shows that we're putting up this winter and spring are just exceptional. I feel fortunate to come into uh, a space that is, is thinking very deeply um, about uh, things that matter very much to, to me. The, you know, the other thing that's been very exciting for me to, to work through is, is a lot of the, um, the opportunities and, and challenges that are bound up in the collection of the museum. You know, we, we steward around 20,000 objects um, and each of those objects has, has a story, right? Like, in, like I was reminded recently, we, we were hosting um, uh, some guests from the Comanche Nation to do a tribal consultation and 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 one of the folks who was um, uh, who were visiting with you know was, was just helped to remind me these are, these are not just objects these are stories right so so like we we are an institution that are full of stories and it's it's um, important for us to recognize that history to honor these objects and the stories they tell um, and to and to like facilitate their potential to do that right like I'm I, I you know I'll, I will say there's there's a project that we're doing this spring I'm excited about all of it right like there's no favorite children these are all <laughs> amazing things um, but we are uh, we're, we're doing a, a project with uh, Floyd Tunson who's a, a of course a, a very well-known regional artist uh, we're bringing an object an artwork of his out from storage it, uh, called Hearts and Minds it was acquired by the Fine Arts Center in 2020 um, uh, but in part due to its scale we've not been able to really uh, feature it. It's, it's huge. It's 26 feet wide by um, 13 feet tall. And, and it's a powerful work that addresses the ongoing impact of gun violence on particularly on youth of color. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for me, it's an opportunity to, to, to both feature that which is, which is in the collection and to, to foreground the narratives that it presents. And then from there to connect with partners in our community to not just show this work, but to truly engage with the issues, right? And, and to work with folks uh, for whom these issues might be most prescient, right? So, so it, it creates for us an opportunity to engage with a number of, of young people and educators in our community to respond to this work. So it's not just, it's not just the museum, you know, trying to, it, it, it's in part us um, amplifying the message of this art, but then engaging with folks who can speak back to it and, and kind of build that reciprocity of dialogue um, so like for, for me, we, we have a ton of material, like we are stewards of all these works of art that have the capacity to build this form of exchange so long as we as an institution are, are fostering that kind of way of working. And, and that to me feels special and then helps to really, um, I think to, to, to Prone's point and Lynn's point, like, like build an actual community around the institution that's, that's mm -hmm. enduring and and, and grounded in, in shared values and, and doesn't feel perhaps so transactional, you know, we're like, oh, I like that thing, but not that thing, you know? So like, I, we want to hear for all of it, you know? Yeah, yeah, we all want to be part of that conversation and, mm -hmm. and become part of those stories as we wrestle them. Uh, and you were starting to get close to answering a video question that I have from yeah. Daisy um, uh, Gowan, who is the curator and the head of uh, Gal UCCS Galleries of Contemporary Art. Uh, and uh, this is her question. Hi, Michael. It's Daisy McGowan, director with GOCA at UCCS. And my question relates to contemporary art. That phrase itself can be intimidating for the general public, even though it means the art of now and engaging with living artists typically, which are generally, they're pretty accessible. I'm curious as to your approach to overcoming the intimidation factor and building the quote unquote art muscle of our community through engaging with exhibitions and programs. And what are some of the strategies you have for helping overcome that hurdle uh, for the community? Thanks. Yeah, so, so I, I'm gonna approach this just from a, a slightly oblique angle. Um, <laughs> Fun, okay. <laughs> So I, I mean, so the first thing that feels important to, to say, because I, I, I hear in the question a, a recognition that perhaps, you know, it, it, contemporary art isn't inherently 
intimidating or frightening, but but it's kind of built up a reputation, right? And mm. and I think it's it's a bit of like, um, well, let me say this, you know, like I I I believe that people are inherently curious and intelligent, right? Mm -hmm. So like, like it, it feels it feels more it like starting out of a space of curiosity rather rather than a space of fear when mm -hmm. engaging with our feels really really um, really critical and and. You know, I wouldn't actually put it on the art. I would put it on the cultural institutions that house the art. I think it is our responsibility to create, and I think this has been the crux of our conversation, uh, a space of trust in an institution and a space of, to, to use Perone's um, words, like radical hospitality. Because if, if you feel secure in a space and you trust that space, then I think you are much more willing to engage with material that might seem different, that might feel a little distant from your experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and that feels to me the responsibility of the institution to structure that space. Um, and I think it it is in part like being very intentional in inviting people in, right? Like um, I think you know this is kind of like like speaking through a, a megaphone, say like just come on in. And to, to Perone's earlier point, it, it doesn't really do it. I think we have to really we have to craft really specific invitations into our space and build trust so we can have an experience with this work of art um, that's not predicated in fear, right? So, so I think it's, um, yeah, I think it is a, 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 an ongoing process of building that relationship with our community um, so it doesn't perhaps feel so jarring when you enter and see something that, that, that's different, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and I think also sometimes, you know, um, it's good to contend with things that, that are going to make you feel uncomfortable, you know, and, and to sort of like invoke something that was um, said by someone who used to work at the Walker, um, you know, like it's, it's important then to create comfortable spaces to have uncomfortable experiences. And I, and I think that's, that's part of what we're, we're after here. You know, like as, as an educator, like I, I sort of lean away from like, in order to get it, you have to know all the terms, you have to know the history, like th those mm -hmm. things are all important. Um, but, but that is specialized knowledge that I don't think is necessarily critical to having these engagements. And I think like, you know, like if you watch a group of five-year-olds look at a work of art, none of those kids are scared. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. we, we build that into ourselves over time. And I think we now need to kind of create spaces of trust so we can work out of that fear and into our natural curiosity. Yeah. You know, I think we, uh, often about how opinionated people are about sports who've never played. Right. <laughs> And like, yeah. what did we do wrong in the arts to make them feel like they can't be yelling from the couch um, about about something they don't like or a choice that was made or something they don't understand, you know? And, and just that level of of being of trusting that you can mm -hmm. wrestle it, and it'll it'll come right back at you, you know. Mm -hmm. And that, that's part of the joy of it. I love that analogy. You are absolutely <laughs> right. Like millions of people are would then like officially be a professional football players if that were the case. Yeah. Maybe we should just start having like arenas where like an artist is painting in the center and people can just like have opinions about their choices. <laughs> um, I have two two more questions um, from local arts folks and, and they're all of them are so great. So I, I want to keep moving forward and, you know, we could have a whole episode about theater adaptations in the time of COVID, but Perone, um, Sarah Shepard Shaver, who is one of the founders of Springs Ensemble Theater and also the theater department chair at Pikes Peak Community College, um, you know, she and all of the other theater practitioners around the region have been experimenting with all different kinds of things to try to grapple with the challenges of the pandemic for their audiences and for mounting performances. She's wondering what strategies you're employing or what are you seeing work around um, producing uh, theater during COVID? Uh, oh, yeah, we could. Is anything working? Something's working. Well, something's things are working. working. I think some things are working. I'm, I mean, I think first, first and foremost, we have to embrace that this is an unpredictable time mm -hmm. and show compassion and grace to ourselves and to one another because um, as much as we're now accustomed to Zooms and handling things remotely and emailing each other, we are all also trying to work through a global pandemic. Um, and so uh, the, you know, as a foundational sort of baseline, the humanity of, uh, you know, in the way we navigate it with one another and how we work with each other is really essential to me. 
Um, the I what I've learned so far is to have plans on plans and backup plans and backup plans for the backup plans. Um, <laughs> that it's really important to hold on tightly, let go lightly, to be ready mm -hmm. to pivot, yeah. and to try to look at the pivots as opportunities. Um, we we've had to make some recent pivots in the theater company, which will um, uh, be public knowledge soon. And, um, you know, having been trained uh, as a director, um, it was part of my training very much in graduate school to um, encounter obstacles as opportunities. And so I try to hold on to that when we have the invariable COVID um, related uh, obstacle present itself to us that um, that we can we have the opportunity to make a choice that is still intentional, that is still purposeful, that is still grounded in our values and our beliefs. Um, and that might be artistically exhilarating if we allow ourselves the possibility that it could be. Um, and then the last thing is, you know, ultimately, um, no play is worth someone going on a ventilator. So we got to follow the science. Um, and that has manifested in um, exhaustive testing and uh, procedures and other COVID-related protocols for staff and visiting artists. Um, we are asking our audiences to trust the science with us um, uh, by showing proof of vaccination and wearing a mask for the duration of performances. And um, and in that, I also try to see it as the opportunity to build community and to build a community of mutual care. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. where, where, because if theater is about gathering and sharing stories and having an emotional experience with alongside people you've never met before, like there does need to be a safety in that room too. There does need to be a sense of trust in that room. And we have to have each other's backs. And so um, I, my hope is that we emerge from the pandemic one day, more caring, more considerate, and more aware of our civic responsibility as audience members yeah. and artists. And you have a play to invite folks to. Yes, you have a performance coming up of, by the way, Meet Vera Stark, or is that part of the announcement? We are. That's <laughs> what, that is going to happen. Um, yeah, we have such an incredible cast assembled, directed by the wonderful Betty Hart. Um, I zoomed into the read through the other night and it was just electric, even on Zoom. Um, and, uh, and um, you know, it's, it's such an unexpected and provocative narrative and one that um, I'm very excited for us to share with our community and, um, and, and hope folks will be uh, talking about it as much as, uh, as much as I love to talk about it. Well, great. Thank you uh, for that little teaser. We look forward to the performance. The last question is kind of a fun one, and uh, I want to go fast. Uh, so and it, it is from Jonathan Andahar, who is also an educator and a theater person. I think every single theater person who we have questions from tonight is in education and also on stages. Jonathan's with Theater to Art uh, and also teaches theater in Spanish at a Colorado Springs school. Uh, and he said, if you could create a multidisciplinary arts spectacle, what disciplines would you include? And what kind of story would you tell? So I'm gonna make you do this fast. So just tell us what you would love to mash together and what kind of story you think it'd be fun to tell. Who wants to go first? Michael, Michael. Oh, God, no, bro, unfair, <laughs> entirely unfair. This is why I'm an arts administrator, y'all, and not an artist, and I have crazy respect for artists. You know, I, I um, okay, so can I, maybe I'll take the cheap way out and just say all of them. I mean, I, I'd love to see something that, um, like in my mind, I can see a constellation, lots of participants, all of whom are using different media in a way that that demonstrates the interconnectedness of of our community here so maybe mm. there's there's like uh there's lights and and writing and video everyone's got a little piece of it um but collectively 
um, it, it starts to get at the, the, the contours of our community, the complexities of that community, the nuances of the multifaceted nature of this particular community. I love that. And I hear so many of the themes from your answers tonight in the idea of that. Not, right. not an artist. And it's probably becoming clear why. <laughs> no, no, it's a great idea. I Thank would you. Love, I, I would love that. to see that come together and to see so many people spontaneously and simultaneously bringing a theme together. All right, Perun, what would your art spectacle look like? First of all, I want to say to Michael, there's an artist in all of us. Secondly, um, uh, oh gosh, I, I mean, I wonder, uh, like, uh, so this is just off the top of my head. I'd be coming, if I came into the Fine Arts Center and I got um, uh, headphones for like a, you know, the an audio tour of a, an exhibition, except the audio tour isn't just like descriptions of, of isn't solely descriptions of the art, but like it's it's like a radio play almost. And then somehow oh. that um, takes me into the theater and I see, a sh and then there's a there's a happening in the theater. And then, um, and then I'm guided outside and there is um, a DJ party in the parking lot and food trucks and musicians. And, um, and it's ultimately, I think maybe like a journey from through, Colorado Springs history through, uh, I don't know. I don't know what the story is, but I think, that it, but, but that it, it arrives in something that feels like a celebration of all of us together. I want to do Perones. I think we should do it like soon. <laughs> I think both of these could actually be part of the same epic night. Double bill. Just invented the 2022 gala of the fine arts Center. And my right. season. Thank you so much for doing that. That's a great pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Woo. Thank you both for being open to doing an, an hour long, you know, meet and greet with the local community in this way. And I, I hope that what you feel is the curiosity and as Michael called it, the community of practice that is eager to welcome you here and to also learn from you and to push and pull as we all uh, keep building what the arts look like here in the Pikes Peak region. So thank you, uh, Perone Yusufzadeh and Michael Cristiano. Um, and you can all uh, learn more about what they have coming up at fac.coloradocollege.edu uh, and, of course, at peakradar.com.